Hello, my name is Alex Isles, and in today's episode, we're going to be talking about DNA and isotopes. Hello and welcome back. It's great to have you here. So, if you've seen the previous two episodes, in the first episode, I talked about the semi-mythological background of the Anglo-Saxons with Hengist and Horsa and the invasion into the British Isles. In the next episode after that, the second episode, I talked about what happened to the Romans and did the Romans actually leave Britain or what was the actual result of the end of Roman Britain and were the Anglo-Saxons already present. And in today's episode, we're going to be talking about the new scientific approach approaches to understanding the Anglo-Saxons. So, so to start off with, I wanted to talk about the difference between DNA, isotopes and grave goods. So starting off, grave goods is what we traditionally have always used to understand how Anglo-Saxons were present in the British Isles. Now this was always seen by archaeologists as a really good method because the goods that you're buried with generally show what your culture is wanting to um, show off. So within the non-Christian cultures, there were grave goods, things that you would take into the afterlife or meant something significant to your friends and your family who buried you. And so we could tell who the Anglo-Saxons were because of the brooches, the belt buckles, the pottery, the items they were buried with. Now, recently, two new methods have now joined this. The, next, the first one I'll talk about is isotopes. And if you've watched my video on Bambra, um, I did a video on the Bambra bones. And when I did this on the Bambra bones, I looked at the isotopes, and this is within your teeth. So this can happen at two different times, one after you're born and you're growing up until you get, uh, when you've got your child, child teeth, as they're developing, you're eating and drinking food, and that then helps your, your teeth to grow, and it gives a signature as to where you grew up. The second thing is when you're an adult, obviously your new teeth, your adult teeth, grow, adult teeth grow through and so the same signature is present from the food and drink that you have there. So an absolute win would be if you found, you know, an Anglo-Saxon male grave or female grave and that for some weird reason they've decided to keep their child teeth and then you could say, oh well, their children's teeth say they grew up in Germany but the adult teeth say that they grew up in, you know, Eastern Britain amazing. Then you have proof that someone's migrated over because of the change in isotopes in the teeth. The reality is, is the chances of finding someone like that is so, so rare that we just have to take whatever teeth we had with children. You know, let's say, for instance, you have a child burial with a mother burial. Uh, unfortunately, let's say that the mother has passed away during childbirth. Then you can sort of have a look there with the isotopes between or like a child has died and a mother's died let's say of disease together you can look at the teeth of the child the teeth of the mother and you can see where you know the child was born and where the mother was living uh, when she was an adolescent and then you can get a picture as well so that's quite an interesting one there and the final one is dna which is obviously our genetic ancestry going back through our father and our mothers and then that then gives us a signature so that we ourselves can then put into certain categories and therefore understand us within the genetic groups that we're a part of. So those are the three different areas. So now we can use all of those methods to understand. So what we're discovering now is that say for instance someone's buried with certain grave goods and we go, oh okay, those grave goods are Anglo-Saxon but they do the genetics and isotopes and they find out the person was British. We can now say that that person has culturally assimilated. So um, a good example is, let's say, for some weird reason, you wanted to be buried with your car and you drove a Nissan. If you drove a Nissan car and you were just buried there and we didn't have your genetics or your isotopes, we'd go, well, maybe the person was Japanese because Nissan is a Japanese car brand. That is a very, very poor explanation of trying to understand grave goods. Because you yourself, you might be, you know, British, or you may be German, you may be American. That might be your culture, but your grave goods say that you're Japanese. Really, really poor example, but I hope you get what I'm saying. So, with that being said, let's continue. With that um, going on, we've now got isotopes. And I want to say this within context of the fact that when we're looking at 5th, 6th and 7th century Anglo-Saxon law codes, we start seeing that it is not necessarily beneficial to be Welsh. Now, Welsh is 
the description and it comes from the Germanic languages and it means foreigner. And so when it means foreigner, you can see this within Wales in the British Isles, within the Wallonia region of um, Belgium, and also the Wallace region of Switzerland. And it basically just means non-Germanic. And within the law codes of the, the Anglo-Saxon kingdoms, it's not beneficial to be Welsh. Um, there is basically a lesser fine on you if you kill a Welshman than if you kill an Anglo-Saxon. Now, when this was being read in the 19th and 20th century, this was seen within racial terms because of the culture and history of that time. And so it was always understood that it was the Anglo-Saxons on one side and the Welsh on the other. Now, we're starting to sort of look at it and go, it's more of a cultural thing. And there's a possibility that this was to incentivize culture conversion from Welsh into Anglo-Saxon and to move the culture over. So that's something to take into account as well. Now, there's been an amazing study called a 3D bessacranial shape-based assessment of local and continental Northwestern European ancestry from the 5th to 9th century AD, done in the summer of 2021. Now this study is fantastic because it takes isotopes and DNA and also grave goods into together and then basically comes up with a conclusion about the Anglo-Saxons based off burial sites across the British Isles. Now, what's generally been found is when Anglo-Saxon DNA has been analysed, they basically looked at it and they said it's very similar to modern-day Dutch and Danish populations. So if you understand Dutch and Danish populations, what you can do is you can take Iron Age Danish um, population burials, you can take pre-Anglo-Saxon migration British burials, and you can take Anglo-Saxon burials from about 410 AD till around about the early 800s when we start seeing the Scandinavian influence of the Viking invasions and things like that. And so when we have those breakdowns, we can then go, okay, we're going to compare the pre-Anglo-Saxon population with the Iron Age Danish population with the Anglo-Saxon migrants. And what they did was they did 3D scans of the skulls and then compared them to see if there were similarities. They then took isotopes from these population groups to find out where people had grown up and when their isotopes were from. And then finally, they took genetics so that they could compare them together. And what they found from this study was that in the early Anglo-Saxon period, so you're looking at from 410 to around about 600 AD, two-thirds of the migrants in both the male and in the female population had migrated from northwestern Europe. And so those, both their genetics and their isotopes, showed, showed that there was a migration, but still a third of the population from both genetics and alongside this as well, their isotopes were local within these Anglo-Saxon cemeteries. Which is a really interesting one there because it shows that a third of the population whose grave goods are Anglo-Saxon are with their isotopes and their DNA are showing that they are local. Isotopes that are local could be third or second generation migrants whose family came across earlier. Think about the story of Hengist and Horsa. They come across and then they call across their friends and family afterwards. So in a similar way, we could be looking at that. But in the middle Anglo-Saxon period, so this is from around the 600s, mid 600s to the 800s, what we're finding out is there is a massive shift. Amongst the female population, 48% of the uh, DNA and isotopes are actually Germanic, and 52% are pre-medieval British DNA. In the same way with the male DNA, and this is something that might really surprise you, 37% was Germanic, and 63% was pre-medieval British. So we're seeing that the men are actually native Britons who have become Anglo-Saxon. That's a suggestion. They're actually amalgamated and they're not necessarily pure Anglo-Saxons within these cemeteries. So that could maybe show a migration from British settlements into Anglo-Saxon settlements and then an amalgamation of these cultures together. Up in Yorkshire, in West Hesbreton, actually some research where they did some research on 32 graves and half of the people, this is an early medieval burial site, had come from other areas in Britain, and only four of the 32 were actually females with Scandinavian isotopes. 
Similar things were also seen down in Oxfordshire where 19 individuals, only four had non-local isotopes, and in Eastbourne in Sussex, which was an area of strong Saxon settlement, and there were 19 burials, seven were non-local, but only four from mainland Europe. So again, we're seeing this real interesting pattern where possibly the Anglo-Saxons are far more settled by the, the early Anglo-Saxon period as we generally date it and their isotopes are actually showing again that these could be second or third generation Germanic people and then their DNA is also showing something similar with the native Britons then culturally converting in the middle Anglo-Saxon period due to the fact that it is no longer suitable to be Welsh or native Briton or Romano-British and now it's time to become Anglo-Saxon. So there's a really interesting one for you there. I hope you've enjoyed this and you've been able to look at it, understand the Anglo-Saxon period a little bit better and how grave goods, isotopes and DNA are a holy trinity of understanding Anglo-Saxon genetics, cultural identity through items and also where people are living. If you have enjoyed, please do like and subscribe, share the video with your friends and alongside that as well, if you would like to support me further, I do also have a Patreon. But until next time, stay safe and well and thank you so much for watching.